This week, we're talking socialism in the Swedish countryside, sky-high activism, and wedding pick ideas, plus flag takedowns, our country's birthday, and a blunt and ugly display of the ultimate low-life scum. But first, let me pull you down from the clouds. Back to the ground, this high can't last. Allow me to kill your high, pull you down from that rainbow-studded sky, back to the ground, the background of depressive realism, creeping to the fore, on the floor like shackles round our feet, while we, with our heads held high, don't look to see, listen to hear what would be so clear save the ringing in our ears, the fog of fireworks, din of cheers, and fucking A, take this day to celebrate a battle won from years so waged, and as the smoke does settle, as lovers' highs do level, pull from this and be inspired. Realize that what comes easy isn't good and what is good is fucking hard. And there are two truths here to mine. Follow the rainbow, rainbow and you'll find a pot of gold marked corporate greed. Drone bomb signed the White House deed. War for oil is our creed. Drilling rigs are planted seeds. Misery is what we'll reap. Oh, I'll hail the TPP. It's not a cheerful wedding speech, but free is not your marriage. See, and even if a shift could come from letting love be blind, this time is not enough to mark it done. Look at how the slaves were freed. Could you say today that the fight for black rights is won? Could you say that women are represented, spoken for on Congress floors just because we now can vote? I don't think so. No, the fight for equal rights, black, white, women, gay, can't be laid to rest, lest our gains be bound with corporate chains, belittled to a for-sale slave. This is not a box to check, a crossed-off line on social lists of our time. This is every day, a fight ongoing, never slowing, always growing, evil never sleeps, never even naps. Don't grab for coffee or a line, life, after all, must be alive. Take in a sunset and smile, rest up and meet us on the front lines. All of you, for your issue is mine and mine is yours, and this is all intertwined, not because I smoked a bowl and see that we are one and nature is our home, no, because the system makes it so. Follow the lies, folk devils and be beady tycoon eyes, an oil spill, an arctic drill, a homeless child, drone bomb sickly song, all the right that they do wrong, stains the name of you and I, a tarnish on the varnish of a land that could do so much fucking better than hoist a flag and claim that fag isn't politically correct. Our standards shouldn't be so low. You don't just deserve to love, you deserve a government of, for, and by the people. How it's meant, not steered by greed or the steeple. You'll be made to think that you don't need to. That this win somehow cleans the sins and now we're on an upswing. But let me ask you, over the din of a corporate-sponsored media freedom marriage church bell ring, what good is that ring? If your hands are tied, debt the only thing that you can buy, pollution stings your throat and eyes, war exported, hate imported, and faded in an old headline, bold, thick words, now shameful lie, we won. My friends, congrats to your love. Now let's get to work. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. And this is one of the places that I grew up. We're not doing an interview this week, so I'll move around a bit to make it more interesting and give you a more panoramic view. This, by the way, is Sweden. And yep, the sun totally smiles here. For those of you who don't know, Sweden is a country in Northern Europe classified as a parliamentary democracy, AKA the king doesn't do much and we have a prime minister. Now, you may know it as the socialist quagmire responsible for Ikea, ABBA, hot women, and really good chocolate. And while well, that is also true, Sweden is not as spotless of an example of socialist splendor as you might think. One might even argue that it's really social socialist. And even if it were, would a socialist utopia be ideal for, say, the U.S.? Or indeed, hello, indeed any nation? Can an anything-ist utopia, utopia really exist? These philosophical questions aside, I think we first need to dive into what socialism really is. So, let's Google some shit. Socialism, social ownership of the means of production and cooperative management of the economy. Don't you just hate it when the wind blows when you turn on your microphone? And when they use the word in the definition, 
So let's clear that up. Social ownership can mean collective ownership such as state ownership or citizen ownership, or in more leftist cases, common ownership, where no one actually owns anything, but everyone has access to it, like a public park. Now, communism pushes for common ownership of everything, and as outlined by this guy, Karl Marx, communism is the utopian ideal, a society where a central state is no longer necessary. He didn't coin the word socialism and communism, but his outline of political and social evolution led by the working classes inspired many an uprising, like uh, the Russian Revolution. Now, according to Marx, communism is the evolution of socialism, or as he puts it, a lower phase of communism. You have to go through socialism to get to communism, kind of like a, an intense rehab program for capitalists. Capitalism cannot be directly converted to communism. You need the step in between, or you'll just break yourself and your ideology and just mold into this twisted, deformed, dictatorial regime with no actual concept of an egalitarian society, which I feel like we've seen. In many ways, Sweden is a socialist nation, or more exactly, democratically socialist. Stay with me now. Your ability to fend off douchetards who call this guy a socialist depends on this segment. And also, to keep you going, here's a picture of a gorgeous Swedish model. Works every time. Now, a social democracy basically means that a strong democratic centralized state exists. Not one intending to transition to communism, but instead one existing in a sort of acceptance of capitalism, like an annoying roommate. However, in an attempt to balance the effects of capitalism, it regulates business and markets, creates unions, state-sponsored works and programs, healthcare, education, etc., to ensure that people aren't living like Americans. Now, economist Richard Wolff strips this sort of socialism of its egalitarian name and calls it state capitalism. A step up from private capitalism, which is what the US has, capitalism driven by private interests. But still, state capitalism, even under the guise of socialism, is not worthy of the name socialism. In his view, socialism doesn't currently exist, and can only exist if socialists tear themselves away from this acceptance of capitalism. The fact that the state regulates private capitalist enterprises and operates state capitalist enterprises does not reduce the capitalist structure of an economy. So long as it's exclusively the employers, whether private state or hybrid, whether more or less regulated, who decide how to use those profits, it is a capitalist structure. An enterprise only qualifies as socialist once a distinction between employers and employees within it has been abolished. When workers collectively and democratically produce, receive, and distribute the profits their labor generates, the enterprise becomes socialist. So, there you have it. According to absolutely no socialist ever, is this guy a socialist, and according to Wolf, neither is Sweden. I'll let you ruminate on the, the break from capitalism and whether socialism is the right course, Marxist or otherwise, but for right now, let's go to the not-so-ideally communist China for some action on the front lines. Xiao Zhu, sincere apologies if I'm butchering that pronunciation, meaning Little Bamboo is a Chinese company that creates bamboo air purification products and engages in environmental and, as we shall see, creative activism to fight pollution in China. Most recently, this activism took the form of projections onto plumes of smoke from factories in the middle of the night. This in and of itself is pretty badass, but then add to that the fact that they were, what they were projecting were images of kids in various stages of pain and suffering, ultimately leading to suffocation. As a final message, clean the air, let the future breathe again, lit up the polluted night sky. A chilling display that by virtue of its very presence is actually also hopeful. These viral images show a citizenry unwilling to stand by as their kids choke on the greed of industry, a powerful combination of creative activism and conscientious consumerism. As Design Boom wrote in their coverage of the action, entering better products into the market is often only a small part of the larger equation. True change lies within education and protest. And in a country where more than 500,000 die every year from causes related in some way to extreme levels of airborne contaminants, there's really no time to cutely commodify this, this issue. You can, however, make it into a fashionable, fashionable wedding photo. Yep, one couple in China decided to turn their special day into a special dystopian commentary. This story might be a year old, but I just couldn't help but include it because it so wonderfully illustrates the spontaneous style of creative activism that any one of us can engage in. I can only assume they hadn't originally planned these unfortunate accessories, but hey, you gotta make lemonade 
or gas masks. So as pollution levels in Beijing reached record levels, some 10 times the internationally accepted safety limit, grounding planes, shutting down roads, and keeping people shuttered indoors with air purifiers, this couple posed for their wedding pictures, which then quickly went viral and caused international outcry and discussions regarding China's continuing pollution problems. And who says activists only wear cargo shorts and tevas? Back in the U.S. of A., and back to recent news, and back to sky-high activism, last week, Bree Newsom climbed the flagpole over South Carolina's state capitol in order to remove the Confederate flag, a symbol of white supremacy that is absolutely no fucking place over a government building, or really any building not stuck in the 1860s. Even if our country wasn't reeling from the continued murder of blacks at the hands of crooked cops and vigilantes, this flag would be enough evidence to show that we're a far, far cry from land of the free. And for all who would like to point out that it's a battle flag, yes, I am aware. But it's a battle flag used by the Confederates as they fought for state rights, which means uh, slavery. Even the flag's designer, William Thompson, hoped that the world would see this flag as the white man's flag. And furthermore, the flag didn't even make it back into politics post-Civil War until 1948, when the Dixiecrats, a group of southern states who seceded from the Democratic ticket, yes, that happened again, used it as a campaign logo of sorts. Then, as the civil rights movement continued to rise, so did the flag. As Southern historian David Goldfield explains in a National Geographic article, in the 1950s, as the civil rights movement built up steam, you began to see more and more public displays of the Confederate battle flag, to the point where the state of Georgia in 1956 redesigned their state flag to include the Confederate battle flag. And in 1962, the state of South Carolina put the Confederate battle flag atop the Capitol building in Columbia. In the year 2000, the state legislature of South Carolina took the flag down from the Capitol Dome and put it right smack on the state Capitol grounds. So it was even more visible after 2000 than before. It's remained a contentious issue for the past 15 years because if you're African American and you walk by that flag, it is a government endorsement of slavery and white supremacy. For African Americans, that's what the flag stood for and that's what the flag stands for. And the history of the flag certainly undergirds that interpretation. So, we can file that argument under racist bullshit and move on. In her own words, Brie explained the thinking behind her involvement in the flag takedown. It's time for a new chapter where we are sincere about dismantling white supremacy and building toward true racial justice and equality. Bree's actions and those of her co-activists were not only courageous, they make a strong point about the ridiculousness, the sheer stupidity of back and forth bureaucratic bantering over certain common sense issues, and also highlight the ability of we the people to make shit happen on our own. This is how easy it is to take down a flag, South Carolina. I imagine you have even easier ways of doing it without resorting to agile activists. Imagine, if this is how easy it is to take down a flag, one wonders, how easy it is, is it to, uh, I don't know, not bomb people or maybe tell Shell to go fuck themselves or force Donald Trump to use his toupee to wash the floors of a single mom on food stamps? Shit that would make everyone's lives so much better and take little to no effort. The fact that it's 2015 and that flag still flies is unacceptable in the extreme. History is one thing, oppression is another. For those itching to use the history excuse, come back to me when you see the Nazi flag flying over the Bundestag. To quote Indiana Jones, that belongs in a museum. Huge props and respect to Brie Newsom for her action and to her group and co-activists for their work. Join the fight against Confederate flag flying over South Carolina's Capitol building by using the hashtag keep it down. Also check out Brie's site for more creative activism as she also happens to be a writer, director, producer, singer, songwriter, and speaker, as well as an expert climber. Now, believe it or not, there's still more to cover on the front lines, but because it's been a while since we had a bit of a break, let's move locations for Front Lines Part 2. It's our nation's birthday this weekend, and despite the fact that we're suffering from a teenage identity crisis, we should celebrate with a non-GMO soy dog, a beer, and a flag. And we should also do what any caretakers of a wayward teen would do and step up the fight to right this crooked course. One way of doing this is to simply take a walk. 
This July 4th, the New Hampshire Rebellion will be marching along the coast of New Hampshire to raise awareness for the corrupting influence of money in politics. The two marches will be 20 miles from Rochester and 16 miles from Hampton. 2016, get it? Both ending in Portsmouth for a rally for independence from corporate rule. You'll even get some free Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Plus, of course, the inherent awesomeness of marching with fellow rebels and fighting the power of plutocratic oligarchic asshats. This march is the fourth one planned by New Hampshire Rebellion, an organization created by Lawrence Lessig, in order to use New Hampshire's spot as the first presidential primary state to force the issue of money in politics onto the national and international stage. The plan? Make sure every potential candidate is asked and answers this question. What specific reforms will you advance to end the corrupting influence of money in politics? Considering the pool of candidates, I can't wait to hear some of the answers. For more information on the organization and to get involved, regardless of what state you're in, check out nhrebellion.org. Finally, let me jump up onto my philosophical soapbox to bluntly showcase the worst low-life scum that this country has seen in a very, very long time. You low-life scum. So sometimes you just have to admit when it's a shitty, fucked up, no good, bullshit ass day. For those of you following the bumbling asshats we call a Congress, you'll know that last week they passed TPA, the fast track for trade deals like TPP, TTIP, and TISA. This is a huge blow to we the people. This is a gigantic fuck you to human rights and the progress of our country and just people in general. So let's not sugarcoat it because the more we say, hey, no biggie. Let's shake it off. The more we downsize the colossal impact that these decisions have on our lives and our future. Except this shit happened. And that it's really, really, really bad. Take it in. Because only by staring it straight in the face will we understand the need, the necessity for us to rise up and literally tear these corporations from their gilded thrones. Fuck corporate power. Fuck the TPP. People, stop smiling for a second. Take this all in and get fucking mad. Understand how horrendous this is. Don't sugarcoat it. Stare it down and do something. For those of you unsure of what exactly to be mad about, unsure of what all these T's and P's are, allow me to explain. TAA, Trade Adjustment Assistance, basically a bill to help support workers when they lose their jobs, due to trade deals, a flat-out admission that this is what will happen. This was originally sent over from the Senate along with the TPA as a package. The House then voted down the TAA outside, so the TPA went back to the Senate on its own. There is now no workers' assistance attached to the TPA. Sorry, workers. Go fuck yourselves. TPA. Trade Promotion Authority. Fast track, the thing that gives Obama or any other president for the next seven years the right to essentially avoid Congress in his negotiations of trade deals. This passed the Senate last week. This is bad. TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the horrendous trade deal, the corporate coup against every facet of our lives, from the air we breathe, the food we eat, the kids we raise, educate, the healthcare we attempt to afford, and more. This is the next step. This is the low life scum of not just this week, but a lot of fucking weeks. This is the next place our fight will take us. This is what I mean when I say I will be tearing you down from the rainbow clouds in the sky. To all my friends who now have the right to marry whoever they love, congrats. It's a huge victory and I'm so happy for you. But while you're planning that wedding, we've got work to do, a lot of work. For more information on these T's, P's, and A's, go to flushthetpp.org and exposethetpp.org. You can also check out segments from previous weeks. But since I'm not one just to end on a sad note, I'd like to give a shout out to the Pope and Naomi Klein. Yes, that combination actually makes sense. Naomi Klein has been asked to participate in a high-level conference on the environment this coming Sunday, put on by the Catholic Church and co-led by senior aide to Pope Francis, climate change economics professor, and high-ranking Cardinal Peter Turkson. In an unprecedented but seriously fucking necessary collaboration, activists and religious leaders will join forces to push for real action on the issues of climate change. I bet somewhere in his grave, Galileo the scientist is smiling. And that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the um, simultaneously, sim simultaneous tour of my Swedish child at home. 
We'll be back in DC next week, but in the meantime, please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, check out the last slide to see all the sites that I mentioned in this week's show. There will also be a link to help support Occupy.com and the delicious descent delivered daily thanks to donations like yours. It is a 501c3, so anything you can contribute is tax deductible and hugely appreciated. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From this socially democratic or perhaps state capitalistic, but regardlessly incomparably beautiful Swedish countryside, good night and act out.